Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. It's, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to today's event. We're going to be taking a case study approach to work toward a collective understanding of dual use research, what its nature is and what are the potential steps that could be taken to minimize its potential for misuse in ways that could potentially harm public health and national security rather than achieve the good aims that the research is intended for. Today's event is actually part of a series, an ongoing series of international meetings on dual use research. Each of them has had a focus on a different region of the world. Today's meeting is focused on Asia and the Western Pacific. And I'd like to take a moment to give some special thanks to our distinguished speakers and panelists from Asia and the Western Pacific who've traveled very far in order to participate in today's event. And I'd like to welcome our US guests as well. And although we come from very different parts of the world, we come from different disciplines, we share many common goals. I think it's fair to say that we all strive to improve public health and the safety of our respective nations, and we all recognize the vital role that science plays in that endeavor. Science is global. There are no two ways about it. But science is also a very fundamental social undertaking that we undertake with the hope of improving our health, our environment, our agriculture, and our economy. But if misused, science also has the potential power to undermine all of those good and important aspects of our lives. And if we don't come together to take action to minimize the potential for such misuse, we run the risk of losing public trust in science, which is probably one of the most precious resources we have and it's something that must be earned and maintained. So I think the challenge before the group today is to figure out how we can both ensure scientific progress while minimizing in very practical, meaningful ways the potential risks of misuse. So that's the challenge that we're here today uh, to address, and we're going to do it working through some very specific examples. Examples that are going to take us from abstract deliberations to some very practical and focused discussions on strategies for recognizing and managing dual-use research concerns. And I hope today that we uh, emerge with an appreciation and understanding of how countries around the world are beginning to grapple with this issue. We're very fortunate today to have with us the senior authors of uh, both of the case studies that we'll be discussing. Now, none of us are going to be using slides. We're going to speak from our seats uh, rather than at the podium. And the only formal presentations in this meeting are going to be from the authors of the two case studies. So we have a nice foundation for the discussions. We'll try to make this as informal as possible and allow ample time for questions and comments from the audience. We do want those who speak to identify yourself and your country. This is especially important since we're going to be uh, filming today's event and be posting it on our website so those that could not be here today could have a chance to um, in, in participate, at, albeit post hoc. I did want to also acknowledge one panelist, Dr. Yuan, who was unfortunately not able to come, but I think uh, he's joining us by phone. And finally, um, on behalf of the U.S. government that's um, uh, sponsoring this event in, in partnership with the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity, or NSAB, is the, hosting the event, I want to welcome you. And I'm very pleased to turn the floor over to Dr. Reed. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. Um, I'd like to thank the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity for organizing this event and bringing scientists and researchers um, from the Asian and Western Pacific region into the dialogue that NSAB has been having on this subject, not just within the US, but also internationally. Um, I'm honored to be here, and I'm humbled to have been asked by the organizers to say a few words um, on behalf of the Asia-Pacific region. Um, I work for the Regional Emerging Diseases Intervention Center. We are a small intergovernmental center based in Singapore. And we work locally and regionally on efforts to strengthen capacity to deal with emerging infectious diseases. 
Our small efforts on the topic of the workshop have been mainly to provide training in the areas of biosafety and biosecurity to scientists in the region. So I'm humbled to be sharing the platform here and the stage today with colleagues who've traveled here and actually have been much more in the forefront of the issues that we'll talk about here, uh, uh, more, much more than the center, actually. Um, bringing together a group of people with different expertise and from diverse backgrounds uh, to discuss what can be controversial is not an easy task, but I think on this topic it seems crucial. The Asia and Western Pacific region is incredibly and intensely varied, not only in its physical and human geography, but in other characteristics that are relevant to our discussion in its governance, in its economic and human and health development. Yet, what I want to try to emphasize briefly are not these differences, even though they're important, but what we share or have in common. And, um, and I think it's important to keep this in mind, even as differences emerge, and especially more so. And I want to highlight three common themes. Um, the first is that among the region, we look at the area of life sciences, biotechnology, and health research with uh, common desires and aspirations, I could say. Not unlike in the US, scientific pursuit, discovery, and its benefits represent opportunities, and opportunities and progress on an individual, societal, and national level. And so governments, institutions, and um, Industry are investing in this area and restructuring and reshaping in support of the endeavor and what it promises. The second theme is that there are ongoing local, national, and regional efforts in the region to try to address and grapple with some of the issues of dual use research. Uh, they make up a somewhat fractured landscape, but nevertheless, they are there and they're important. And though there may be uh, broad and sometimes profound differences in the degree of awareness, um, perception, uh, the implementation of norms and standards, governance, and most certainly the resources that go into the area. And these are also factors that influence research activities, practices, and research risks. There is also, for the most part, again, a common recognition that many of the questions that arise from dual-use research dilemmas cannot be addressed in a singular fashion. Um, not by one nation, no matter how powerful one body, one region, and certainly not by a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, so the reality, again, demands that we work together um, among peers, between institutions, between agencies, across sectors, and most importantly, across borders. And third and finally, Another common theme is that, like I guess many other groups that come together and attempt to both self-scrutinize and self-regulate, many of the issues, more often than not, begin with kind of a common unit, I would say, the individual. And the individual scientist and researcher, his or her peers, the community and the environment in which they work, um, and the understanding that we need to develop about what inspires and motivates good scientific practice in different contexts and responsible research behavior. And alternatively and realistically also grapple with what conditions lead to um, accidents, negligence, and unfortunately and hopefully rarely opportunities and intent to misuse science. So and how can our diverse and sometimes essentially competitive scientific endeavors, if I might say, kind of evolved to be guided by common shared principles. Um, the way that maybe we can think of, uh, even if imperfect examples like how the Hippocratic Oath uh, binds together medical practitioners or the Declaration of Helsinki defines um, ethical principles of human research and the International Council for Harmonization of Good Clinical Practice Guidelines guides the conduct of trials in human subjects. So these are among many considerations, and just like trying to consider issues where positions, opinions, and context can differ, um, such as bioethical, bioethical or legal dilemmas, um, I'd like to thank the organizers, actually, for choosing what I believe is an ideal format for this dialogue, which is the case study format. I believe the case studies will be the best way to stimulate discussion, and not only that, we'll actually hear from the scientists who themselves conceived, conducted the research, and who had to wrestle and deal with its results and consequences. So here we have the opportunity to consider and learn directly from their experiences. And so I hope that all of us present will seize the opportunity and participate fully and interactively um, in the coming hours. Thank you. 
Thank you, Zaf, for those excellent comments. I think those points are, are very well taken and, uh, and really lead us uh, forward on this, uh, on this meeting today. Um, while we all recognize the important contributions of scientific research, as Amy has said, to improve health, quality of life, environment, agriculture, and, and our economy, we must also, also recognize uh, that good science can be put to bad uses. Before we begin our discussions today at this, what we've called the intersection of science and security, I'd like to briefly describe what we, the NSABB, mean by the terms dual use research and dual use research of concern. Over the past 10 years, there has been increasing recognition, both here in the U.S. and in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, of the need to consider that new information, products, and technologies from scientific research could be misused to pose a biological threat to public health or the national security of, of any of our nations. The term dual-use research acknowledges that information from research can be put to harmful as well as beneficial uses. Dual use is inherent, really, in virtually all the life sciences scientific research. So we, we've sort of felt that that category is almost too broad. Therefore, we use the term dual use research of concern to describe the subset of dual-use research that has the highest potential for generating information that could be misused for harmful purposes. I should mention that the NSABB has focused on dual-use research within the life sciences, um, as we are, are mandated to do. But we also recognize that dual-use research is not confined to, to only this uh, sector or this discipline. Uh, it might also be seen in uh, radiation work, in nuclear work, in nanotechnologies, even in information technologies. But our focus is on biotechnologies. Today's discussion is a wonderful opportunity to hear perspectives on this issue from individuals from other parts of the world, and we really value that opportunity. I should note also that this concept of dual-use research is more meaningful to some individuals, to some countries, and, and to some regions, as, as Dr. Reed has mentioned, than it is to others. Not every country has a committee like the NSABB, and I'm not sure uh, that we know that every country should have a committee uh, like, the, like the NSABB. However, we all do have scientists working on this uh, with powerful uh, new tools of biotechnology. And actually, because of what we love about our, our fields in biology, its complexity and its tendency to surprise us, um, I think it's useful for us to think in advance about what if our experiment does surprise us. And that's kind of what we're here for today. The Asia-Pacific region, as Dr. Reed has also mentioned, is already a powerful uh, geographic region for biology research and innovation, and it's getting stronger every year. We don't have all the answers within the NSABB or within the United States, but we do value the opportunity to work with fellow scientists and clinicians from around the globe. I value the opportunity to share your experiences um, and thoughts about the way ahead with regard to uh, dual-use research. So what we do hope to accomplish today is related to this fact that scientific research is a global endeavor. We believe that dual-use research is a concept worth considering, worth understanding, and that we all have a responsibility to use the powerful and wonderful tools of biotechnology and the knowledge that's generated wisely for the good of mankind. 
and to have some sense of what to do if we are surprised, as scientists were in at least one of the case studies that we'll discuss today. I think for all of us, the goal is to continue to advance science, as, as Amy has said, and to make positive contributions to our health, our food supplies, even our energy supplies, while at the same time assuring that it is applied for the benefit and not for harm. We owe that to all of our citizens in each of our countries uh, that we represent. So now I would like to turn the microphone over to the co-moderators of the first panel. This one is entitled Discussion of Science and Security Issues Utilizing an Article on Mousepox as a Case Study. Uh, the two moderators, co-moderators, are uh, Dr. Harat uh, Wati Sudoyo and from uh, the uh, Eichmann Institute for Medical Sciences in, or for Molecular Biology, excuse me, in Jakarta, Indonesia, and Dr. Jeffrey Miller, also a member of the NSABB, uh, from the School of Medicine at UCLA. Thank you very much, Dave. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I have been introduced. My name is Sarawati Sudoyo, and the Deputy Director of the Eggman Institute for Molecular Biology, uh, President of Indonesian Biorisk Association, and also uh, the member of Indonesian Academy of Sciences. My co-moderator is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Meller, uh, an NSBB member, professor and chair of Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Molecular Genetics from UCLA School of Medicine. I'm honored to be the moderator on the first panel. We also have five uh, panelists who came all the way to discuss these interesting topics, and I would like to invite them to join us at the stage. Dr. Robert Floyd, Director General of Australian Safeguards and Non-Proliferation Office, Canberra, Australia. Dr. Michael Selgelit, Senior Lecturer and Deputy Director, Center for Human Bioethics, Monash University, Australia. Dr. Chan Wa Kim, President of Asia Pacific Biosafety Association. Professor, College of Life Sciences and Biotechnology, Korea University. Dr. Murukkar, Senior Scientist, uh, Kum Biosafety Officer from Indian Veterinary Research Institute, Bhopal. And we have one uh, panelist who cannot come to this uh, discussion, Dr. Ziming Yuan, from uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences, Wuhan Institute of Virology, who will be connected by a teleconference. We have our presenter, Dr. Ian Ramshaw. Dr. Ramshaw is the director, National Center for Biosecurity, John Cartin School of Medical Research, Australian National University, Canberra, Australia, who will be, uh, give a presentation on this uh, panel one. Dr. Ramshaw. I've actually been asked to give a potted history of our 2001 paper, which caused a little bit controversy at the time. Uh, it's a history of the things that we did do, a little bit of the history that we didn't do, and we hope that it's open for all discussions from this point of view. One of the uh, problems Australia has is every four or five years, there's a mouse plague. We have lots and lots of rabbits in Australia, and all of which uh, influence agricultural output. We usually use biocontrol agents to control the rabbit population, such as myxoma, Khaleesi virus, but both the rabbits and the viruses are co-evolving to live happily together without major effects. So the idea was we needed a new biocontrol agent. The idea was to make a virus that 
only infects rabbits or only infects mouse, that causes immunosterility. Our modeling systems say this would be a very, very useful way of controlling the population. And for some reason, it would be humanely rather nice rather than killing them. So what the idea was, was to make a virus that encodes a gene for a protein involved in reproduction. And the idea was the virus would infect the animal, the animal would make antibodies to the encoded protein and cause infertility. It was a nice idea and we went about it and the protein that we used was called ZP3 and it's found on the ovum. And it's the docking point of the sperm in this case. The idea is the animals would make an antibody like we would make an antibody to influenza vaccine and prevent fertility. In fact, it worked remarkably well, surprised us all. Those animals that were infected with a mouse pox virus which contained this ZP3 were infertile for the lifetime of the animal under those circumstances. The rabbits have the same, they had the same effect under these circumstances. So we had developed a new, new technology which caused infertility. It's the next step that we added to this that caused all the controversy. And I'll go into that now, but there's a lot of bright individuals in this audience, and I wonder if some of you have already picked up a dual-use issue that we missed at the time. And that dual-use issue is we've created a transmissible virus that causes infertility. That was never discussed at the time. And that's fascinating. In other words, I think they actually made a science fiction movie, uh, Men of Boys or something like this, where the world was made infertile by a passaging virus. So here's an example of dual use that we ourselves have missed. We, didn't, we published without ever recognizing it. What we did recognize, however, was when we tried to increase the potency of these viruses that caused this Im immunosterility. And we added another gene called interleukin-4. And this gene is a cytokine. It's used by the immune system to stimulate antibody responses. So the theory was that we'd get better antibody responses with these virus, with this gene in. In fact, what we did find was the, not that the result, but the result was the viruses were highly pathogenic and it killed mice rapidly, and even mice who were genetically resistant were killed with this interleukin-4 virus. The interleukin-4 itself suppressed the immune response, and that's why it was killing the virus under these circumstances. So basically what we had shown is that we had a greatly increased pathogenic virus that antiviral drugs didn't work against. We had showed that later. But more importantly, and this was the staggering effect that shook us at the time, was that vaccinated mice that would normally resist an infection were not resistant to this interleukin-4 virus. The interleukin-4 virus killed the vaccinated mice. And it was at that point that the researchers identified what is now known as a dual-use dilemma the dual-use dilemma in biological scientists, sciences was not recognized in early 2000, but we said there was a problem. Now, how did we deal with it? Well, basically, we asked all our colleagues, what should we do? Shall we publish or shall we keep it secret? And without going into too much detail, in an audience this size, it was presented to all our academics. And the general consensus, the majority, the almost 100% consensus, was to publish. So we did ask our colleagues, and the answer was, there's enough out there that you should publish and let everyone know what is possible under these circumstances. In fact, the great Frank Fenner, who was involved in the eradication of smallpox, also had this view. So what happened next in terms of history? 
we submitted the article to the Journal of Virology, and it was accepted for publication. Around a little time before the publication, there was a a roving reporter from New, New Scientist called Rachel Novak came around and wanted to know what interesting things we were doing in research. And I told her all about our great work in prime boost immunization with HIV, and she didn't seem that interested. But I said, oh, we've got this paper coming out that shows that vaccinated mice can't be protected against this virus. And her ears picked up like no one's business. This was an article that she could get her teeth into. And she wanted to write about it. We obviously couldn't say no. We accepted that because it was coming out in press in a month's time. And she write, wanted to write the article in The New Scientist. We asked if the article could be sent to the institutions concerned a few days, before, a week beforehand, so that we could look at it. I didn't think it was too dramatic. It was dramatic in terms of new scientists. But the institutions themselves said in their bureaucracy, it's a common feature of bureaucracy to try to protect themselves, we better advertise it ourselves. We can't wait for new scientists to come out. We will announce these results ourselves to the press. And when those results were announced, I think it went viral around the world under those circumstances, that this was the example of what biotechnology can do under these circumstances, and this was a major, major concern. Now, I don't know if the institutions themselves created the problem themselves. It's not an experiment you can redo, but it may not have made the headlines it did had the institutions had just accepted the new scientists. But that would, that, that would be a guess under these circumstances from, from that point of view. The rest is history. In other words, the paper is quoted as a dual-use example under these circumstances. But what I haven't talked to people about is some of the experiments that we did after that, after the papers. And those are the experiments we chose not to publish. In other words, we did make an individual choice not to publish certain papers. And I can just briefly touch upon these from, from, that, from that point of view. Many people thought that the virus was so pathogenic it wouldn't transmit. In fact, it does transmit. Transmission of this virus occurs exactly seven days after infection. And if the mice lives that long, it will transmit. So it does transmit. One of the very interesting findings that we made, and it's, I won't go into the details why it's interesting in terms of biosecurity or elsewhere, was when we looked at these animals, these vaccinated animals, being vaccinated, infected with the IL-4 virus, when we look for virus in these animals, and these animals died about a day later than normal non-vaccinated animals, so they were killed very quickly. When we looked for virus in these animals, we couldn't find any. Vaccinated animals challenged with the IL-4 virus lacked, or seemed to lack, any virus in their system. That was a remarkable finding, and we looked very, very closely for this. And we could detect very, very low levels of virus. A hundred, a thousand platforming units of virus was present in those animals, and that's quite remarkable. So these vaccinated animals actually aren't dying of the virus, they're dying of the toxicity of the interleukin-4. And that's a really quite a significant finding from this point of view. Uh, we also looked at other, these vaccinated animals, or, although have little, little virus, they still transmit. We aggressively, and I really mean aggressively, vaccinated these animals to see if we could find a vaccine that would protect against interleukin-4. And our most aggressive vaccine protected about 50% of the animals in transmission. But interestingly, the other 50% of animals 
actually developed a persistent infection. They didn't die. It was though there was a battle between the virus and the immune system, and they lived their life with a permanent pox virus infection. Now, I'm finishing up because I've got 10 minutes, and I've often been asked whether I regret ever publishing this work. And in retrospect, I think the answer is no at the time. I think at the time, in 2001, were the times when this wasn't brought to public attention. And I'm glad we did publish it, because if we had have hidden the work or not published the work, then, it was mentioned earlier, then we would receive the distrust of the public. The public and the administration that looks after these needs to know what can be done and what is out there. And this was the first example of this under these circumstances. So the answer is no, I don't regret it. I think it's been very useful in the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Ian, turn your, turn your thing. Thank you, Dr. Ramshaw, for, uh, for joining us and for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, and you sort of alluded to uh, the, the sort of retrospective assessment, and that's actually our, our first question for the, uh, for the panel. Um, and, the, and the question is very simple. What, what might be done differently today to address the security issues regarding these experiments, not only by the investigators, but perhaps by the journal editors, by the funding agencies, et cetera? Uh, and then sort of an extension of that, what, what is likely to, to, to happen today? And I think we'll uh, start with our, our panelists. Uh, Dr. Kim, do you want to uh, uh, share your, your, your thoughts on this? Yes. Um, currently, uh, most of the institutions, uh, they have uh, uh, IBC, in, uh, Institutional Biosafety uh, Committee. I think that uh, IBC could do a lot of things for this. Uh, especially for researchers, before the conduction of the research, uh, research had to submit research uh, uh, proposal to the IBC. And the IBC would then evaluate the research proposal in aspect of biosafety and uh, also biosecurity concerns uh, before approval. Uh, but for government, uh, I think uh, uh, in the current systems, maybe when they grant a research uh, fund, uh, there could be a lot of criticism for concerns. Mm -hmm. So that could help. But uh, for journals, I think we don't have uh, any uh, formal mechanisms yet. So probably uh, from now on, maybe we uh, all uh, together uh, work together to, to make some uh, formal mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, the, just, to, just to point out, th this is really not so much a biosafety consideration, it's a, it's a biosecurity consideration by extrapolation. And, and so uh, I, one of the, the IBCs may or may not be able to, to, to deal with that. Dr. Floyd? Thank you, Dr. Miller. I, I couldn't agree more with your last statement that the IBCs seem to be the institution of choice for dealing with biosecurity matters. And yet, I wonder whether we fall into a trap by going that route. And that is that there is a very significant difference between issues around biosafety and issues around biosecurity. And sometimes we will roll a third B into there as well to do with bioethics. Each of those Bs have their own set of considerations and expertise and background, but more on that later. A couple of comments I'd like to make, though, about uh, Dr. Ramshaw's case study. Firstly, the outcome of concern was a surprise. It wasn't actually the intent of the study. And that's an important point because it would make sense that best practice would be to consider the biosecurity implications of a piece of work 
before it is done, rather than making decisions or implications being drawn late in a study as to whether it should or should not be published. In this particular case, that wasn't possible because there was a surprise outcome that came out of the study. The second point I'd like to make is, as a great American philosopher said, you know, the times are changing. Back when uh, Professor Ramshaw and his team did this work, it was actually before 2001. It was before the anthrax attacks in the US. And so when they raised these questions, the consideration about appropriateness, I contend, would be different than the consideration today. I didn't say the conclusion would be different, but the consideration would be different. It's important for us to see that the context we operate in is changing. It's not immutable. It does move on. There was some attempt by um, Professor Ramshaw and his team to engage the security community to get their views on this, and there was not strong engagement. I sense from my engagement with the security community that could be quite different if this same scenario was to happen today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Floyd. And certainly the, the times are different. In fact, the Journal of Virology uh, Forum for Reviewers now has a, uh, a drop-down menu uh, regarding dual-use research of concern. Not to say this, this would or would not have been flagged, but at least that, that process is, is in place now. Uh, Dr. Ramshaw, we'll give you the, uh, the last word on this. What would you have done differently, if anything? I wouldn't have done anything. I couldn't have done anything different. And I'm not seeing that nowadays there's much that's been instigated in Australia that would allow me to do anything different. In other words, you say the security com community might be more interested. They weren't there at the time. They didn't know what this was. Go away, please don't disturb us. That may be different now, but we've asked the uh, gene regulator to put a dual, when we look at these biological containment, to put a tick in the box, is this a dual use issue? This is the only regulator that we can think that would, could address these issues. And in fact, in Australia, they've turned it down in a, in a very nice, polite way. They don't want to deal with dual use issues. So there's nothing in Australia, to my knowledge, that serves anything different if we were doing the same experiments again. Nothing has been instigated, and that's worrying for me. I'm sure there's, that's not the same with all countries, but certainly in Australia, it's not. They, these things have not been instigated. Dr. Floyd mentioned that uh, IBC might not be actually evaluating that uh, biosecurity concern in terms of that. So what, what, so what kind of system that has been established in the countries or in the region to regulate the biosafety, biosecurity concern issues? Uh, uh, and how is the potential for dual use research and concern in uh, Asia Pacific. Maybe Dr. Yes, Dr. Murdergaard would like to talk about it. Um, see, I, uh, I tend to agree with uh, Dr. Floyd uh, regarding uh, IBSC's usefulness, basically because uh, the thing is, um, the expertise which is required to actually evaluate uh, the biosecurity potential, uh, bio threat potential of any kind of a research, you know, and that too as a consequence and not as a beginning, is extremely uh, difficult to get from the Institute Biosafety Committee. You just have three or four members, and many a times in particularly in my country, what happens is our Institute Biosafety Community consists of two biotechnologies, but then you also have one, bio, one medical professional, purely because he has to take care of the kind of things, who may not necessarily be really equipped to actually, you know, evaluate this, this kind of work. You know, the, uh, it again comes down to that individual researcher who is actually, you know, go, uh, going to actually start his work. You know, when he's go, do, doing his own review and when he's do, going to do his own work, uh, maybe he would be in a better position to actually, you know, at least visualize 
sometimes, not always, you know, it could be very rare, but then sometimes uh, he could be in a position to actually visualize what could be the uh, potential consequences after he works. And then in our uh, country, we also have institutional research committees uh, where, you know, particularly in government uh, setup, whenever a new research project is uh, proposed, it's proposed in front of an entire institute, uh, all the scientists who are there. Like, the, you would have a, a house like this, you know, where, and then uh, probably, you know, it could quite poss be possible that one of them would be able to, you know, gauge the uh, potential risk, what would be involved uh, following, you know, the culmination of any kind of a research project that that in the investigator takes. Uh, other than that, again, it ultimately depends on, you know, because see, the thing is, many a times, uh, the kind of uh, product that you ultimately come up, it actually is unintentional, you know, the, 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 nobody must have, as Dr. Ran from even himself, my mind not have actually predicted that this would be the result. So it's very difficult to take this thing, you know, right at the beginning in a more complete way, actually. Thank you, Dr. Murugat. So it seems that no one size fits all, because Dr. Kim mentioned that might be the IBC in Korea could actually also uh, evaluating the biosecurity concern. I think we would like to hear uh, the uh, comment from Dr. Selgalit. Yep, so an important aspect of this study and other controversial dual-use studies that have since arisen has been the idea that maybe there needs to be more oversight of scientific research and scientific publications, especially in cases when the research might yield or does yield dangerous discoveries. And you know, there's different ways um, that that oversight could go. There's different kinds of things that could be done. It's important to recognize that there are important and very relevant precedents um, that could be you know, thought of as models, you know, that could, that we could learn from when we, when we think about how we, what kinds of systems we should put into place for oversight of dual use research. So for example, we have ethics committees that review proposals of medical research involving human subjects or animal subjects with an eye to, you know, reviewing issues of subject protection. And we have institutional biosafety committees that look at proposals for uh, biosafety risks. So those kinds of committees provide precedents for having uh, systems of review for you know, important kinds of, of dangers that might arise from research. Such committees could be piggybacked upon. So you know, either one of those two kinds of committees could you know, take on the added role of you know, re reviewing for this additional kind of danger, dual use. Um, there's a question about you know, the extent to which you know, those existing committees um, have the capacity to take on this additional role, the extent to which they have the expertise for taking on this additional role. So maybe new kinds of committees um, could, should be established to deal with this new kind of problem. There's an important uh, guidance document that was recently published by the World Health Organization. And one thing that it says about this issue is that uh, one size doesn't fit all. So you know, different countries that have different systems can handle this kind of issue in different ways, piggybacking on different systems they have in place. Thank you. Uh, I think we have one panelist who is not present with us, but he is following our discussion. Dr. Yuan, are you following us? Yes, I, I, I yes. follow you. What about your comment in China? Good afternoon, what is your everyone. Experience? I'm sorry I can't uh, come to the United States uh, to join you, but anyway, I can participate in your discussion. And uh, I would like to make some comments about uh, the presentation. You know, even if nowadays uh, there, is, there are some institu institutional biosafety committee and to do some evaluation of biosafety and biosecurity issue based on some law regulation or code. And it just uh, review and supervise, supervising the physical requirement, the risk assessment, the SOP, passenger stocking and transfer personal training and so on. But the 
there is no no regulation, no no task to evaluate the sensible information or no regulation, especially on synthetic biology. So first of all, I think it is needed to have some regulation on the classification of some sensible research and information, as well as the regulation on synthetic biology, I think, such as the risk assessment, classification of genetic elements and host, as well as classification of source of the research. Of therefore, I, IBC, I think it can, can have more more role, and we should describe the IBC's role, IBC's role, and to focus on, to to accept to the basic biosafety and biosecurity issues, and also focus on the dual use research and to evaluate is is risk or is classification. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're on a, a fairly tight schedule, and, and we want to uh, be sure to have time for questions and, and comments from the audience. So if, if you'd like to come to the microphone, please uh, state your name, your affiliation, where you're from, and I'll ask uh, the, the panelists here to just raise your hand if, if you'd like to address uh, any of the questions. Dr. Cohen. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Murray Cohen from the U.S., a voting member of NSAB. Dr. Ramshot, seems like the the main lesson learned from your description of you know the history ten years ago is that what you didn't do was probably more important than what you did do, and that ultimately it was the individual responsibility that you felt personally and for your research team to deal with these matters of what to publish, when to publish, et cetera, et cetera, and that any kind of research oversight, Michael, such as you were describing, um, is secondary if necessary at all. So within this construct, you know, Dr. Harawati, you are uh, president of a Biological Safety Association in Indonesia. We have on our, among our other guests, presidents of Biological Safety Associations in countries throughout the regions. I'm wondering what role you might envision, or maybe in fact, currently be happening for fostering this culture of responsibility, individual responsibility among the research community, and in particular, the research community in universities where you're training our next generation of life science researchers um, to pay attention to these issues and not have to rely on some secondary oversight from government bodies and what have you. And it's not just the biological safety societies, but also the individual uh, scientific professional societies that that all of you and all of us are engaged in. Thank you for that question. Actually, uh, because of the case study, I certainly became interested in dual use issues. And with Michael Sellegood and Christian Enemark, we set up a, a national bio, uh, biosecurity center to discuss these issues. And education, to me, seems to be the very first step to go. And with a Sloan Foundation grant, we set up a series of traveling road shows to various organizations, to research institutions throughout Australia. It, they were well attended by the researchers themselves. And it was more like this, a question and answer, what would you do under these circumstances? And it really worked extremely well. I'm not saying all the researchers believed what we were saying but at least we got to the discussion stage. And I think education is terribly important. And we now are introducing this at the undergraduate level, the ethics of science. And I think that's an important area that we also cover in. So you've covered the point. I think this is a major, major uh, route is education. Thank you. Uh, one of the mission of the Bioris Association is actually to raise awareness in many stakeholders uh, working on life sciences. So I think I would like to also uh, strengthen in your comment that education is very important, education to everyone working on the life sciences. And also uh, we have to advocate the government in terms of what is biosafety and biosecurity. So this is one of the mission of the 
um, uh, association actually to bridge to give a bridging between the scientists and the uh, government. Involvement also in the analyzing the regulation available and what needed for this kind of activity. So that uh, kind of things that uh, our Indonesian Biorix Association do. Could I ask similar comments from um, Korea and from India, where you also are uh, distinguished presidents of your biological safety societies? Uh, actually, uh, this was one of the major uh, areas where uh, we started uh, dealing with. Uh, uh, we have been having a workshop uh, uh, which, uh, which are sponsored by WHO on um, biosafety and biosecurity. And um, uh, this time, uh, we, we just finished it about two months back in, in August. And this time, one of the issues that was uh, raised by uh, uh, one uh, uh, researcher from the medical field was exactly this. Uh, he says that says many times what happens is it's very difficult for us to comprehend what we are actually uh, coming up with after we finish our research work. And then, you know, by that time, it's a little too late for us to not to publish it because uh, ultimately, you know, we, have, we are also responsible for the funds that we have got. So it's extremely important that uh, even you know some sort of a the sensitization of even if if at all uh, IBSC is going to be our main uh, uh, body to actually oversee things, we need to sensitize the biosafety committee members regarding uh, these issues because the, the, they become the first focus of our actual research. You know the thing is uh, okay. See when you are actually going to evaluate this or when you are going to carry this, you also take this particular issue into account when you are doing it, if possible, uh, do it. And if it's and see, the thing is, it's not necessary that uh, IBSC takes decision right then and there. If, if required, they may take um, uh, help from other experts who are there in other uh, in uh, who are there in other areas of the country or world, and say, see, this uh, particular this thing uh, has this particular researcher has proposed this project. Uh, we see there's some sort of a problem uh, which could come up later on. Uh, what is your opinion? You know, the, so it has to be. You know, the, we can't restrict uh, this kind of a particular evaluation of uh, this research to a certain two or three people. You know, you need to have a lot of uh, sensitization, not only among IBSC members but also the researchers who are going to, uh, you know, present uh, prepare their projects. You know, they should take that into their mind, and it has to come as a habit. You know, they should always be there on the back of everybody's mind that okay, like if at all I'm doing going to carry this work I had this thing, would there be such problem uh, which could come across later on? Because, see, once uh, you carry out completely, complete your research work, and then at the time of publication, if we stop our work, you know, uh, particularly if it is stopped by the publishers or uh, editors, uh, it's not fair for the researcher, you know, and, and there will be a lot of resentment against it. So it's extremely important that you know we have any step that has to be taken, it has to be taken before the work starts. Maybe through research committees, review committees, IBSCs, and for and the researchers. So it's it's just a matter of sensitizing the whole population who is involved in this particular work. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Kim. Do you have a brief comment? Yes, uh, in Korea, um, uh, PL3 facilities we have to get the license from the government. And PL2 laboratories, we have to register. Uh, for educations, uh, above PL2, most of the universities, uh, they require certain number of credit uh, to the students and all researchers uh, should take certain uh, classes. But unfortunately, uh, other students for example, in uh, general biology, uh, in the curriculum, we don't have any biosafety-related uh, chapters uh, covers. So probably that we have to work on later. Thank you. Thank you. Again, we're, we're sort of uh, mingling uh, biosafety and, and biosecurity. And it's, it's really, uh, the bi biosafety is, is uh, obviously a fundamental uh, issue that tends to be more developed. Uh, going to the next leap to bio biosecurity is really what the challenge is. We have another another question. Yes, I'm Mark. 
I'm Mark Dennison from Vanderbilt University. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Ramshaw, I um, wanted to ask you a few questions. And, and these sort of relate to actually perhaps the, the other thought in the other direction about the limitations placed on this. The first is sort of a, a blunt question. If you had been told by a group that, that you could not do this work or should not publish this work, what, have, what would have been your response to that? Um, actually, Mark, I, I would have been quite happy with that. I wouldn't have too much concerns. I, I know you, we talk about academic freedom, but the issues are too big for academics to insist they have their freedom. And I think this is coming more and more to the fore with recent examples. We have to, I think, draw a line, and somebody somewhere has to say this or this cannot be done. Now, I don't think it's the local institutions because they essentially don't have the expertise and someone like yourselves or the WHO needs to come on board with these issues and tell us academics that you don't have total academic freedom if the world health popula the population of the world has a health problem with your research. And I think I would have been more than quite happy to not to publish. And in fact, I give you the example when we chose not to publish ourselves. And we've still got that in, the, in, 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 our, in our lab books, and we will not publish that. Uh, we, we see no advantage for the academic community with that knowledge, although they're interesting, interesting fact, it leads to other issues which I haven't expanded upon. Okay, that leads to just my, I, I will limit myself of my 12 questions to just one more. Uh, I think we, Dr. Floyd, did you want to comment as well? I can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I guess that leads me to the question of uh, this is easy in the retrospective scope to say this is a concern, but as you know, as a virologist, um, infection uh, does not equal transmission, does not equal maintenance in a population, does not equal viability. And pox viruses being the masters of, a, of acceptance of different genes, that one might postulate that this would have been something they would have found if this was advantageous to them in terms of incorporating an interleukin or a, a, other, um, other immune modifying gene. And so what do you speculate um, would be the outcome of this in a, in a natural environment? Would this be maintained would this, uh, or would this virus die out because of uh, the, the type of infection it caused? Uh, basically, uh, what the pox virus does under these circumstances is stimulate the host response to produce the IL-4 itself. So it, it has learned to deal with the IL-4 and the, uh, there's another molecule called IL-13 in a roundabout way. It hasn't incorporated these molecules, but they do modify the immune response through that mechanism. So it's already learned that lesson. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I will uh, ask you these other things offline. Thank you very much. This discussion, I think, very helpfully illustrates a number of very important points. One of those is that from a government official point of view, regulation is actually the last resort, not the first resort. And so issues of awareness raising and peer review and those kinds of non-regulatory mechanisms should be the first resort. So, I think it's, a, it's a, a dangerous space to go to say, I looked for a regulator, I couldn't find one, therefore I could go ahead. I don't think that's a very sound way to go because it is better that regulation is a last resort, not a first resort. The second point, I was um, expressing some concerns about the, the institution by a safety committee construct. Let me just elaborate slightly, is that I think a better construct is around bio-risk and not biosafety. If you look at bio-risk, then it can include issues of safety and security and even ethics. And that more holistic approach, I think, bears consideration, noting the comments that it's not one size fits all. However, with an interest in change processes, the juggernaut of safety is huge. The interests and knowledge and expertise around security is sparse. So if these bio-risk committees are to adequately assess issues of biosecurity, 
it will be difficult. And so we need to look at the change mechanisms that might be required to morph those constructs, if they're the ones we should use, to take full account and proper account of security issues. Can I just illustrate just finally from my own experience, I spent 20 years as a bench scientist, as a biologist. Through various accidents of history, I ended up in the Prime Minister's department doing security policy and working very closely with the security community and continue in that world now. I thought, when I was a practicing biologist, now rather a lapsed one, when I was a practicing biologist that I knew what the security context was. It was when I moved into the security policy space and started working with the intelligence community and others that I found out how little I knew. That worries me. And my suggestion, Chair, for the solution you know, as to we move forward is somehow we've got to see the integration and the recognition of the different communities of interest, the different expertise, the different knowledge that needs to be brought to bear if we are to adequately and appropriately deal with biosecurity risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think with Dr. Floyd comment, we would like to close this uh, panel discussion. It is a very interesting and very uh, fruitful discussion. Uh, and we will move to a second uh, discussion, panel two, who will be chaired by uh, Dr. Michael Selgelit and Dr. Dave Franz. Thank you very much for the panelists and also the presenter.